Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody, and our thanks go out to Ken Quiethawk for that amazing introduction. You can find him and his wife's website at nativestorytellers.com. Check it out. It's another way of preserving history that has kind of fallen to the wayside that they are happily keeping alive, and it's a form of history keeping that all of us should be aware of. Mark has one of our favorite people on today. He has Maria Wheatley with us. And um, she is she is both a favorite of Mark and me because we both have enjoyed her presence on our shows a number of times. She always brings new and enlightening and, and intriguing and insightful and um, material that, that, that raises questions as to what really happened in our past. So she's much better than a dull old history book and a lot more fun, too. So... Mark, welcome to the show, and you have Maria with you, so welcome to you both. Yes, yes, uh, both of us are here. Yay! Uh, yes. <laughs> um, you know, you know, with all the pre-show uh, banter, I kind of have a feeling we could go into all kinds of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Topics um, that, that I don't have on my talking point sheet, but uh, that's all right. You know, maybe we we may get to it anyways. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm really looking forward to today's discussion, and I I, I think Maria is going to um, yeah, be taking us into uh, s- some new directions about. Reconstructing megalithic um, Britain, southern England. Um, she she can tie in uh, some of the recent uh, appearances by Ahmed Osman, you know, with her uh, trip to uh, recent trip to uh, Egypt. Um, you can get. Uh, a little bit more information about uh, uh, her uh, presentation of Stonehenge to Laird, who you just had a terrific interview with him just on uh, Monday night. So uh, we have a whole bunch of new topics to uh, discuss today, as well as Maria's upcoming appearance at uh, contact in the desert, which probably her first appearance probably should have been a long time ago since she's that uh, informative of a speaker. But um, I think mean, we're just a little biased here, but uh, mm-hmm, at least she'll probably. be there late uh, later this month. So, okay, uh, I'm done r- ranting for a while. Uh, hi, Maria. Hi, hi Mark, hi Barbara. Thanks for having me on the show again. It's a pleasure. Yeah, 
And, you know, we're just always glad to have you. And, you know, uh, maybe, maybe if the listeners are uh, really good today, uh, you can give us a Viking sword wielding exhibit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll save that for the end of the show. But, it, you know, uh, uh, Maria, you just returned, like, literally returned from Egypt. And, you know, Ahmed Osman was on with us with, uh, a couple times uh, over the last uh, two weeks. And, you know, Maybe you could you know, expound upon s- some of the information he laid down for us. Um, he, and when you were uh, in Egypt, you, you did a little bit of uh, dousing. Uh, what were some of the uh, conclusions that you reached from um, do- doing your own uh, studies there on location. Yes, I mean, Egypt is a fascinating place, and quite often it raises far more questions than answers, as it has done, you know, for many, many years. And it's still one of the unsolved mysteries of the ancient world. And Egypt has an attraction and a pull. Uh, it is really quite a fascinating place. And when it was visited by two French diviners, that's Dousers, back in the 1930s, it was seen in the Valley of the Kings, at least, that certain uh, mummies were buried with what they interpreted as a style of pendulum called the Karnak pendulum and the Isis pendulum and the French diviners really studied the nature of these devices which they thought were actually more than pendulums they were energy devices and each one is based on a particular shape that you find everywhere in ancient Egypt for for example the shape of the Karnak pendulum is very distinctive and wherever you go in temples of the new kingdom at the valley of the kings itself you see it illustrated So they studied uh, the nature of these energy devices and realized after quite a bit of examination that they related to the rays of the sun, the rays of the sun god Ra. And that one particular pendulum called the Isis pendulum could literally pick up on the color spectrum of the sun, which, as we know, contains infrared, red, right the way to the violet range and then ultraviolet. They also realized that there was other colors that were hidden from the naked eye, if you will. One of those colors was called the negative green, ultra white and ultra black. So they studied it so in depth, Dowson, that it's never been reached apart, I'm sad to say, by Himmler himself in the 1940s. But their research really looked at the nature of the sun in relation to earth energies and healing. So when I was in Egypt recently, I was looking at the sites through the eyes of the master dancers that went before me. And we were literally charging up some pendulums to the energies of the place. So part of the journey was literally using these energy devices. And I'm really thrilled to say that we had two doctors on the tour with us. And both of the doctors will be using these energy devices in their practices because they felt the energy of the site and they felt the energy of the pendulums. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, um, are the... Yeah, you know, let's just take um, like the the, the Luxor Temple. You know, uh, were you there? It's, you know, just kind of looking at you know, throwing out a, a couple of the uh, you know places that Ahmed uh, you know, mentioned. But it, it, you know, are are they built on these ley lines? Uh, um, you know, if you weren't at the Luxor Temple, you know, it was. Yeah. You know, no, like, oh, 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 okay. You know, or, or 
uh, places like the Luxor Temple or you know, the Sphinx, are, are, are they built on these ley lines where the uh, Earth energies are that uh, detect, uh, detectable uh, by uh, people standing there? Well, yes. I mean, when we look at uh, a huge temple like Karnak and Luxor and other temples beside like Edfu and Hathor's temple, what we find as part of a design canon in relation to ley lines is that you either get an earth current or a ley that sets the axis line of the temple space. So quite often, for example, you often get ancient monuments, not just in ancient Egypt, align into the east and to the west, where the sun rises at the equinox and where the sun sets. So yes, you quite often get a lay there. And if it's an earth current, it's always interesting to note, and especially in medieval churches across, across uh, uh, medieval Europe, for, for example, you get a female current would determine that it's a feminine named church, like dedicated to St. Mary or St. Catherine. And if it's what's called a male current, it tends to be dedicated to you know, a male saint, for example. And that sets the same pace in ancient Egypt, for example, at Hathor's temple, you have a female earth current flowing down the axis line. But since the 1980s, with two great master dowsers called Hamish Miller and Paul Baldhurst, they noted that major ley lines have two currents entwining them. One is male and one is female. They're the earth currents. They're the power in the land. So the ley is by itself quite powerful, but if it's with a lay system, it's even more powerful. And what Hamish and Paul noticed, that there was just two uh, currents entwining the lay that goes right through southern Britain and through Avery Henge itself. But in Egypt, what I have been noticing is you have a major lay going like from north to south, from uh, lower Egypt to upper Egypt. Uh, and that goes through quite a few a few of the temples, for example. But you don't have two earth currents entwining them. You have three. And that's, yeah. that's highly unusual. So I think there's a lot of geomancy work to be done uh, in ancient Egypt that is really in its infancy because we know about the major ley lines and earth currents since the 1980s from Hamish Miller. And it was always documented from 2000 BC by an emperor in ancient China. They just didn't call them earth currents. They often called them dragon lines, for example. And they made a science around that, a geomantic science, which they called feng shui so you have a lot of different energies at any one time going on in ancient temple space uh, uh, what effect does, does this third current have on people well it's interesting if we if we look at the nature of the gods of ancient egypt for example you have isis and osiris and horus they're a kind of trinity of a pantheon of gods. Yeah. So that's what I've kind of nicknamed these currents at the moment. And when we, when the people were interacting with them with their dowsing instruments and pendulum, it was interesting to note that the the Horus current, if we can call it that, seemed powerful but on a different level than the other two. So we, we need to kind of, ideally, you'd want to do some energy surveys with equipment there, which is what I did at Avery, by, you know, sinking some copper rods into the, the ground. But obviously, at a World Heritage site at Karnak and Luxor, I don't think you'd get away with uh, improvising with, with copper somehow. I'd probably end up in an Egyptian prism. Uh, and, and we don't that, want that. And we don't want that. And incidentally, when I took the Karnak pendulum there last year, it actually looks like a bullet. 
okay? It's brass and it looks like a bullet. So I'm going through customs and I get pulled over by a very angry customs officer who thinks, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a terrorist. It was terrifying. And thankfully, our Egyptian-speaking guide was saying, no, it's a pendulum. So he was really insistent this year when we went through Luxor Airport, please, no pendulums in your hand luggage. We're all going to be looked at uh, in a different light. But, uh, but seriously, you know, with uh, these energy devices, you can, you can look at uh, a lay on a different level because ley lines aren't just straight going through the ground. Uh, of course, they are when you look at them uh, on a map of Earth or you look at them drawn on a piece of paper. But the, the master deltas of old used to see them as containing a lot of light. Uh, the whole range of the color spectrum and often one color dominates. So let's say we've got a ley, it contains all of the uh, colors of the electromagnetic spectrum, it's interacting with the sun, but you may get a dominant color of blue, or you may get a dominant color of red, and that adds to the interpretation of lays and some earth currents. Yeah. When Ahmed was our guest, uh, uh, you know, a couple of times recently, it, it, uh, he, he really emphasized in his uh, book, uh, you know, the Egyptian origins of King David and the Temple of Solomon, uh, about you know, the, you know one of the crowning glories of you know the ancient Egyptian engineering. Uh, it was uh, um, uh, c commenced by Amenhotep the uh, third, and you know, he was you know, just building all these uh, fantastic palaces that were uh, in, in temples that you know stood the test of time, and you know, get the different statues that are surviving. Uh, have you looked into uh, Amenhotep's choices of locations, or you know, what his like Hermes, the uh, you know, architect, uh, you know, who's building places, these uh, you know, just fantastic uh, uh, monuments. It, it was all these are are all these places built on uh, these uh, ley lines? Is it, like how in tune were the ancient Egyptians to this subject? They were very knowledgeable of earth energies, and wow. you don't just get a lay line. You always get a multitude of different types of energy as part of the design canon worldwide. By that, I mean at the pyramids, at Stonehenge, at Karnak uh, in France, and Karnak uh, in Egypt, actually. You always get a lot of underground, very, very deep water that emits a spiral pattern. And that's one of the first uh, design canons that often is centered in the esoteric center of a monument. And that's, that could be slightly off center, for example, because if we see that the deep underground water emits a spiral pattern, then that is always incorporated into temple space. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's like the aquifer. You have groundwater aquifers, okay, and that could have been rainwater falling yesterday or 30,000 years ago, for, for example. You can have groundwater like that, but below that groundwater, you, you have even deeper water, and it's that water that emits a spiral pattern. So sometimes you can have like quite, quite deep aquifers by a groundwater aquifer, and it was the archaeologist Tim Champion uh, back in the 80s that realized that all of the European causewayed enclosures that's a Neolithic monument, about yeah. five and a half thousand years old, were all aligned on the meeting point of two aquifers. 
And, and then later researchers like John Burke came along and kind of added to that initial statement. So we know that underground water featured in the design canon across the ancient world. Why? Underground water that is very deep tends to emit a quite a harmonic hertz frequency. Unlike groundwater, if you live above groundwater, all doubters worldwide will tell you that that gives off a very bad hertz frequency that can break down the immune system. And in Germany, a survey done of 11,000 homes showed categorically that the people that lived above groundwater, not the deep water, groundwater, was susceptible to cancer. They even called them cancer houses. But when you get that very, very deep water that has a spiral pattern, that's quite harmonic. It's only the groundwater that's fine to drink, just not good to live above. So the ancients knew about these good and bad energies. So when we look at today's modern building program, no one takes into consideration groundwater, but in the Neolithic and Bronze and Iron Ages, they certainly did because all of their settlements, as well as their sacred sites, were aligned on positive, harmonic, living earth energies. That's a design canon for the beneficial of the health of the community. Yeah, I, I, I was... You know, after you know, Barbara and I spent so much time uh, going through uh, Ahmed's uh, book. I, it, it just seemed like there was uh, th- this uh, sacred temple you know, building program that was you know c- commenced during Amenhotep's. Uh, rain that the, the engineers and the decision to build on you know, these uh, uh, on the site wasn't just random. It, it just seemed like there had to be some type of uh, very specific reason. And, and, and you know, your explanation is. Uh, Really, I know that's yeah. You know, wasn't uh, part of his uh, you know, thesis of his uh, books, but I mean, you, you, you're t- taking his information uh, to another level, and, and, and you, you know, you're making it even more intriguing. And, and, and it is uh, uh, what's what, what's the name of the uh, uh, I, I think it's a mausoleum. It has like all, uh, a really long flight of steps that goes back to a uh, colonnaded uh, uh, building that's like it, it, uh, built into the side of a. Um, You're talking about a mortuary prop. temple? Yes. Is that, Is that for a queen? Yeah. Have such, have I, such, I, I, have such, I can't yeah, really that, pronounce that, her name. Oh, uh, 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 I, I, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it was a woman, I, I, Sarah. I, 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 yeah, I, I, yeah uh, uh, Maria, I, 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 I I'm sorry. I, I just drew a blank on the uh, the, the, the the official name of it. Um, but I, I always, it's always been like a, a really uh, uh, awe-inspiring facade to this building. I, I was just wondering if you've ever been there, and I, I think that's in the Valley of the Kings, or yeah, I, I, I've been there a couple of times, and it is quite. A- uh, you know, an immense building, and as you, ca- it's on a couple of layers actually, like on a mm-hmm. couple of stories. It's 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 very very dramatic uh, to look at, and uh, I think you pronounce it um, Hap uh, Hap Shepsut or something. Okay. Here. Pharaoh's name and there's a statue of her in Cairo Museum for example and they depicted her as having a beard you know like you get those long beards that most of the pharaohs had and she 
depicted like that. But she was a strong, strong leader. And what I found quite beautiful about her, her temple space, uh, if you will, is as you walk up the steps and you're on the ground floor and you go to the right-hand side of the building, there's this wonderful area that's dedicated to Anubis. And you can see the depictions and the colors of, uh, of Anubis. And that's, that's a very, very powerful part of the temple. You just look around and, uh, and see depiction after depiction. But, you know, at the time, it was a bit like, you know, across the ancient world for, for um, Hatshepsut to, to be the, the regarded as Pharaoh, as a woman. That, that was quite a big, a big thing. And uh, she was, you know, quite, uh, quite well liked. But her temple space is immense. And again, we see a very similar design canon to other monuments worldwide where set in the axis line on the open, it's just slightly off to one side, actually, at that temple space. You, you have, uh, again, there, you actually have a lay going through that area set in the temple axis line. And when we go to a place like Abydos uh, in, uh, in Egypt, you too have a, a kind of like a lay going right the way through, but behind Abydos, which is quite a Greek-inspired monument uh, in a way, by like the Ptolemies, and uh, you have a, a similar design at the Acropolis in ancient Greece, where you have a lot of uh, columns in one space. But if you imagine a, a big line going right the way down behind Abydos, you have the Osiris. Ancient Egypt gives us layer by layer by layer of wisdom and knowledge and, and insight. Um, the the more our ability to grasp and understand the spirituality that is behind the structures. You know, at first they were just looking at how cool is this, and then they got into artifacts that they were able to sort of date, and then they got into the position. And, um, and, and so it, it sort of has evolved generation after generation after generation. Every time we think we have it all figured out, there's another level to be peeled. It's, ancient Egypt is very much like an onion that that we go from from just how cool is that structure and you know let's dig up this head that turned out to be the sphinx to looking for the passages inside of the of the sphinx looking for um the hall of records and and then we go beyond that into are there passageways under the giza plateau is there something magical there is is there another level of understanding another culture even that might have created those um, those tunnel ways and those passages that are beneath the Giza plateau, and so it, 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 you know, we are on a, on a, an, an amazing adventure over the decades of, of not only enlightening from the intellectual knowledge of these structures, to getting into um, what kind of wisdom and spirituality do they bring to us, especially with a lot of the, uh, the star alignments with. Sirius and Orion's belt and all of all of those. Is there another message there for us? Uh, we were talking to uh, Laird Scranton uh, the other night about how, how <clears throat> the hieroglyphs do tell stories and and how they how the pictures give us a message that can be linked all the way back to Go 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 Blackley Tepe. Um, still there, Mark? Yes, I'm here. And oh, okay. I'm calling Maria back. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, hi. Okay. Hey, me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think we have resumed the show. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, no. The okay. show was going on the whole time. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, I'll, cu- I'll cut my. Uh, I'll that's cut why my you're. Rambling sound. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, uh, that's why, why you're. That's why you're the producer, and I just ask the stupid <laughs> questions to get, get people chatting. They're not you know, stupid. Uh, they're good questions. But you know, it, it, um, you know Barbara, do, do, do you want to finish the uh, rambling that you were doing? And yeah, it was it was it, it was a good rambling. Um, I, I was inferring that. Um, ancient Egypt is like an onion, 
and every generation we think we have all the knowledge and then as we as our consciousness expands we're able to see and accept and embrace another level of consciousness that they're that they are revealing to us from from the from the you know cool big building to ancient mysteries to artifacts to spirituality to alignment with stars to consciousness to the message given in the hieroglyphs over the generations we have become more accepting of the magic that they hold and as we become more accepting of the magic that they hold we gain wisdom that is ancient that that helps us to evolve as human beings that's the end of my rant The rant is a very good point because I did have a spiritual experience last year at a temple called uh, Kamombo, right by the Nile. And uh, I I wasn't actually in a particularly spiritual space. I mean, I wasn't meditating or anything like that. I was just, you know, uh, walking uh, walking along and uh, experienced the temple space. And we went back on the Nile a cruise boat that was parked nearby and uh, and that evening I just woke up bolt upright and had this buzzing sound by at the bottom of my feet and this buzzing sound then went right up my body uh, like through my chakra system presumably like kundalini rising went above uh, my head and then kind of back down to the heart or the solar plexus or the navel uh, region, I can't really remember uh, exactly. Uh, and then uh, I, I've, I had this experience where it was, I was aligned to either the dark or the light. And wh- whoever was showing me this was showing me the kind of magnetism of the dark and the healing and the beauty of the, the light. And for me to choose which path, which obviously I chose the light. Uh, and then I couldn't speak the next day for many, many hours, actually. I'm, I'm glad that didn't happen today. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, but what, what was the... Uh, uh, okay, you, you, know, you chose the light. You know, what... what uh, effect did this a- a- a experience ha- have on you? Is it uh, like uh, j- just like a, a, a some type of a- epiphany? It was it was an experience that I really did feel that was an empowering moment where I felt mm. everything for some reason changed for me. Color seemed to be a little bit brighter, for example. Sound seemed to be a little bit sharper. And my smell seemed to be a little bit greater. It was like it enhanced my senses. And and when I came back to the UK after that uh, tour with that experience, it was like I saw every shade of green. I can't, I can't describe it really. It was like uh, my, my sight. And the colors had had improved, or oh, I was seeing everything through different eyes, more enhanced eyes, and felt very uh very glad that I had that experience really I mean it was really one of those life changing moments, and I think that's what ancient Egypt can do, as indeed many other places can it can uh, offer us those life changing experiences that you know uh, are game changers. Uh, let me, you, know, you just told us a little bit about the experience uh, left you with enhanced uh, sensory perceptions or whatever, you know, whatever the term is. Uh, did, did it leave a tattoo? <laughs> no, but I should have another I, one. I, 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 Okay, well, well, I will talk about that um, uh, when you come back in a couple. You know, I think, I think we have a schedule for uh, returning in a couple weeks. Yeah. But can, it, can I ask a question, yeah, Mark? Oh. Um, sure. We, we were. T- sure we've been Mark. talking. 
your show. Um, we've been talking a lot uh, with a lot of the guests that we've had on with the concept of spirals and how they they um, appear in a lot of the ancient buildings. And it feels like Maria experienced one of those spiral experiences where she was taken her to her core and opened up to greater light. So did you get? Did you have the feeling of of a spiral experience there? No, not not at all. And I'm quite used to uh, spirals. You know, with working with the, with the geo spiral deep water. No, it was yeah. just like a, a kind of straight line buzzing from hmm. the bottom of my feet right the way through the the core of uh, of my being. That's it. Felt quite linear uh, in a way. Very cool. But Maria, before the um, well, uh, technical situation we had a few minutes ago, um, I'm sure there was some government agency that thought you were <laughs> giving out too too much good, good information that had to disrupt the transmission. But it, you know, you were talking about the Egypt may need to be the uh, antiquity may need to actually go uh, back further in time. Uh, like there is just uh, and you get a little bit of the. Uh, uh, people talking about the Atlantis connection, you know, th- things like that. You, you know, maybe, maybe things do do need to be redated. And you know, you uh, make a really good point about that. Uh, that some of the English megalithic monuments really should be uh, moved back to the m- Mesolithic uh, period. Instead of Neolithic, but uh, you know, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, you know, what do you think about uh, you know, another major uh, Egyptian landmark like the Sphinx with the water erosion uh, that that is, is running horizontally along the Sphinx's body, not uh, which w- would show that it. It had sat in water, and it wasn't, you know, the rain uh, eroding down its back and then dripping down the side. It's two different types of water erosion. Do do you think the you know people like Robert Schock who've argued that uh, the Sphinx actually shows that there is some kind of uh, inland sea or the Nile was much wider at one point and it was sitting in water for a very long time. Do, do, do you think that is very possible? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, I think uh, Robert Schock was correct uh, and uh, Serpent in the Sky, written by the late John Anthony uh, West, mm-hmm. uh, was a seminal book on the subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, for sure. I mean, the two things that leave a very distinct Distinctive trace which archaeologists look for is water deposits and charcoal right. fire deposits. I mean that leaves such an impact on a monument. It's uh, it's an it's a no-brainer. But our guide, I mean he uh, Armro, he was the one of the top curators at Cairo Museum. Uh, he can interpret any cartouche. He's very open-minded. Um, and he has a theory about the Sphinx, other than just the water, which he respects Shock's work. For example, he thinks there were two giant Sphinxes, and, uh, mm-hmm. and one is maybe a bit of a distance away. Because when you look at the tablet, as you go, as you go through the Sphinx's paws, there's like a tablet uh, that's on the back uh, section. And it has two sphinxes at the top. And he did a whole thesis for his archaeological degree on that. So he's saying that he doesn't just think it's that one. Where the other one is, is uh, yet to be discovered. But I think looking at uh, all the other depictions of sphinxes, whether they form avenues 
uh, you know, in, in Luxor area, uh, or at the, the the Sphinx, they're always in pairs, as as he points out. It, yeah, it. it I, 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 I'm really glad you brought that up. I, 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 I've always wondered about that. It, you know, there, it, there, there is that tablet. It's like be, between the front paws, and, yeah. and, and and there are sphinxes facing each other. And you know, I, I have no idea how you read the hieroglyphs. Uh, you know, it seems like it's. Uh, and uh, you know, a relatively understood uh, language by uh, by now, but it, it, you know, the little bit I I know of it, 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 it seems like the, the artists were trying to be pretty accurate with what they were saying in you know, the artwork hieroglyphs. Uh, so I, I, I've wondered about that second Sphinx too. I, is uh, you know, the possibility the second second Sphinx is it, it's uh, you know, possibly buried under the sand or could it have been dismantled? Is there any Indication that uh, yeah uh, it, it got washed away or something in the folklore that it it was destroyed you know, during you know some uh, you know di- dynasty. Yes, I mean it's it's difficult to say because it's conjecture to a certain degree but mm-hmm. nonetheless in all probability it could have been uh, dismantled in part and then the rest are uh, buried which is presumably what one thinks but it would only take lidar that's the uh, plane flying over putting down ground penetrating uh, radar to uncover lost cities lost uh, you know, objects like that in in that area. So I think, you know, that could easily be found. Well, not easily. It could be helped to be found uh, more readily using uh, modern-day equipment like that. So I think really, you know, what we think we know about ancient Egypt is just scratching the surface of what what Egypt is really, Mm -hmm. really about. That, that, that That is the thing. And, you know, uh, even when we go to a place like Saqqara, the Step Pyramid, that had a hospital by it, renowned for for healing. And uh, many, many years ago, when I used to study complementary medicines and then practice them, such as reflexology, I can remember from one lesson, uh, we were shown uh, like a hieroglyph, uh, in, in, which was taken from the inside of Saqqara, shown reflexology being administered. And we know from some of the aromatherapy sacred oils from ancient Egypt that they were uh, found apparently in, in Saqqara area for, for healing purposes. And you have like the blue lotus, oil which is renowned in ancient Egypt to activate the crown chakra and I think it's red amber for, for the base chakra for for example so this so the use of practice of ancient oils goes back millennia in ancient Egypt as the practice of reflexology okay um, Maria like since you just mentioned LIDAR, I'd like to uh, kind of change gears for j- uh, just a little bit. Um, it, you do have an interesting pamphlet on white horses. And, you know, since I'm uh, Night Lights, Eric Cartman, I think. Uh, we should kind of skip the discussion of the CERN giant and, and just kind of focus on 
like the Uffington White Horse. Because, you know, you do mention that um, uh, there, there is, you know, dowsing helped to detect that it had been transformed from the, the original design to what it is uh, you know, uh, today is, you know, you know, uh, you know like on your uh, way towards Oxford. Um, you, you know, what, or, you know, can, can we make so, some kind of uh, connection, like with these lane lines, the you know, positioning of the uh, white horse and, it, you know, the pyramids, mm-hmm. uh, you, you, you know, with these un, um, whirlpool um, you know, spirals underground of, you know, the water. Yes, I mean, the, the Uffington White Horse uh, is the oldest chalk hill figure in Great Britain. It's uh, a late Bronze Age uh, monument, so we could say, you know, that's about sort of 4,000 years old. Okay, it could be possibly a bit older. And it's a stylized uh, white horse. So if you imagine that in the Wessex area of South England, that you only have to go a few millimetres, a few centimetres rather, below the ground, and you hit chalk bedrock. It's white, brilliant white. And so the the grass that grows on top is very shallow. So you only need to dig down a little way, and you come to this, this chalk. And what our ancient ancestors did in the Bronze Age is they carved this gigantic white horse on the side of a hill, the side of Ufferton Hill. And it's 365 feet long, which some people say represents a solar year, for example. And it can only be seen from the air. The original outline of its face and its back is probably the most original. And the rest may have changed over the course of 4,000 years. But it has been a monument that has called out to people and visitors for millennia. It's sited in a ceremonial landscape. I mean, we must realize that you very rarely get one monument by itself. It's always in a ceremonial landscape, as indeed the pyramids are, Stonehenge, Avebury, and the White Horse is no different. So the White Horse is associated with an amazing Neolithic long barrow called Wayland Smithy that's on an ancient ridgeway and by ridgeway I mean that's a very high ancient track that dates back to the Mesolithic period it's about 12,000 years old in part it's now believed to be the ridgeway so if we imagine you've got this ancient road leading you to this uh, long barrow which is very different from the other long barrows in the area because it's aligned north south and this long barrow has chambers on the uh, kind of north uh, northern side of it which you can enter and which the ancients probably used in phase one of that monument for initiation, ceremonies, possibly even healing. And then at a later date, they placed bones of the skulls and the long bones inside of those chambers. And then it was sealed off for all time. But Wayland Smithy is a very, very magical place. It really is. It's surrounded by beech trees. And to any druid worth their weight in gold, that's considered a very feminine tree. And when the wind strikes beech leaves, they almost kind of whisper an oracle to you. I've used uh, equipment at Wayland Smithy for recording. And, and we've got the sound of like flint napping recorded Uh, at Wayland City, which is quite uh, inexplicable. But we're mentioning again just lays. It was Gary Biltcliffe and Caroline Hall, two uh, dowsers that I have known for, oh gosh, it must be about 20, 25 years now. I I really uh, respect them greatly, as they do I. 
it was uh, Gary, uh, must have been uh, decades ago, that discovered that there was this major ley line called the Bellinus line that goes from the Isle of Wight right the way up to Scotland's uh, tip. And entwining this uh, line, and incidentally, uh, the uh, ancient King Bellinus was a road builder, so it's associated with a kind of like pathway, roadway, this lay in part. And in twine in it, Gary uh, discovered that there was two currents, male and female again, a bit like what Hamish Miller discovered, and he called these earth currents Ellen and Bellinus. And they are associated, these earth currents, with every single monument within the Uffington White Horse complex. The Ellen current, the female current, flows down Wayland Smithy Long Barrow. So we could say if that was a medieval church or a, a temple in Egypt, that would be dedicated to a female god or a female saint, for example. And then when we come to uh, the White Horse, uh, the earth current flows right the way across the, the horse's back. And then on to Uffington Castle, which isn't a castle of medieval Britain. It's just called a castle. It was a ceremonial center for the Druid community on top of a, a hill. It's associated with that. Both currents cross in the middle. And close by to the White Horse, you have a hill that has been sculptured flat on top called Dragon Hill where those earth currents cross again. And right on Dragon Hill is spectacular because it's a huge patch of bare chalk. And legend tells us that St. George uh, slew the pagan dragon there. And where the dragon's blood dropped, no grass shall ever grow. And no grass has grown there for, you know, centuries. So, uh, so the myth is correct in that part, even though St. George, the patron saint of England, was from Turkey and uh, took over from an actual English person, that uh, is, uh, besides... But uh, nonetheless, we have a whole ceremonial center associated with earth currents and, and uh, a lay. And it was Master Dousers that looked at the white horse and kind of did a, a lot of dousing work and realized that at one time it could have even been uh, a kind of female pregnant horse representing possibly the fertility in the land and over time it lost its like pregnant belly section and became much much slimmer as we see today there's a really old rite that's uh, exercised at the white horse and that's if you walk from the tip of the tail right the way down to the, the face and then stand on the eye you will have good luck for the year ahead because like I said there's 360 feet each representing a day of a year it's believed by some so there's a lot of superstition around it and it's it's probably dedicated to the goddess Epona from whence we get the word pony from for example or Rhiannon one of the kind of Celtic horse goddesses but it has that spirit of place, Uffington White Horse. It has a kind of ambiance there that takes us away from the modern day to somewhere in the past. And these monuments, to me, are a, a physical reminder. We can touch them and they take us back uh, to, to the past. So when we look at the Uffington White Horse ceremonial landscape, let's think beyond the lay and think there's earth currents meandering around and crossing. And wherever those earth currents cross, especially in ancient China, were revered. And they were decreed so sacred they'd be for the emperor's palace or the emperor's tomb. They were very special locations where we balance our mail side to our female side so there are points in the landscape and if a, a, if a site is aligned on the crossing point of earth currents it represents harmony and balance and tranquility so the the earth currents that entwine a lay are are the power in the land that decree masculine and feminine or balance of the both and, and, and maria you um, 
mentioned a, a couple minutes ago about the uh, you know, like these causeways and uh, ancient highways, you know, uh, leading towards uh, places like uh, Wayland Smithy. Um, you know, there were you know, southern England had a lot of those um, basically ancient highways connecting all these sacred uh, destinations and you know they're actually uh, like the sweet tracks were elevated uh, but basically I uh, would call them carriageways uh, uh, above the swamps and marshes or you know, like going from Glastonbury to um, the South Cadbury Hill Fort. Uh, it's, it, yeah, the level of engineering that was going on in this you know, two, three thousand BC time period is it, just really amazing, and, and, and it's not just England and e- Egypt. You have some of the a- a- ancient roads on display at uh, Ireland's Craigenowen Museum as well. Well, that's right. I mean, the, the ridgeways were uh, practical and sacred at the same time. And like you uh, quite accurately described, they were on high ridges, on high elevated ground to avoid uh, swamps below. But more than that, because again, we're on chalk bedrock, and chalk bedrock is very good at you know, sending uh, electromagnetic signals, has been pointed out. But when we see this road, we see it as a chalk white road, a ceremonial white road streaking through the landscape. And I've walked the Ridgeway to Wayland Smithy at night, and you can't get lost. You're following this streak of white. And when the moon is up high, it really does shine down and illuminate your path before you. So I think there was a lot of kind of sacredness uh, attached to these chalk roads. They were more than just a road above a a swamp, uh, swamp area. They were the ways that you would walk from one part of England to the next, passing sacred sites along the way. Because if you follow the Ridgeway from Wayland Smithy, you will arrive at Avery Henge further on down that chalk road pathway. So I think our, our ancestors uh, combined continually the spiritual with the practical, and their their sciences were, you know, a, a combination of things like astronomy and astrology, and and the two weren't deemed separate. You had the that had metaphysical applications and law behind things. And that's, I think, what we've lost to a certain degree today, the metaphysical understanding of ancient science. Okay. And you know, we're, we've completed the first hour the, the uh, Maybe take out a, a couple minutes for hmm. my uh, tech issue, but um, anyhow, if uh, you know, maybe you should just take a, a you know, a little bit of time to discuss that if people are enjoying the diversity of. Uh, uh, megalithic uh, topics were you know kind of bouncing back and forth between ancient Egypt and uh, southern England, uh, and we have more uh, you know a lot more discussions uh, or uh, 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 topics com- coming up on s- southern England as well. Uh, but if you know, the listeners enjoy uh, you know, what you're discussing, uh, you know, the, the thoroughness, uh, you know, your hands-on experiences of 
walking the ridgeways and uh, being in uh, you know, dousing in ancient Egypt, uh, you are going to be a speaker at the prestigious contact in the desert, and you will be doing a workshop as well. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming appearance there at the end of this month into the first couple of days of June at this conference? Yes, it's going to be uh, very exciting for me to be at Contact in the Desert, and I was absolutely thrilled and delighted to be asked. So um, I'm going to be talking there about my research into the long-skulled people of uh, Stonehenge and having a look at some of uh, other stone circles and energies that you find at ancient sites, some of which we've discussed here and some of which we haven't. So I'm going to be looking in depth at uh, uh, the power of place, why put a monument there? What's going on? And what happens if you put some sort of sacred geometry on the top of that? And why were the people uh, aligning their sites? Who were the people? And I'm going to be showing some skulls and some antiqu antiquarian drawings of uh, skulls and sites of people of the places in which they built. So it's going to be quite exciting uh, on that level. I'm also going to be doing a dowsing workshop. I'm going to be showing people how to find negative geopathic stress energies. What's geopathic stress? It's negative earth energies. And if you live, like I mentioned briefly earlier, above ground water, so a shallow aquifer water, it's considered carcinogenic. There was an amazing survey done. I mentioned the one of 11,000 houses. There was another survey done in Germany of including 8,000 people, and they discovered that a third of all hospital emissions in the survey, which was over seven years, were down to geopathic stress. That's taken a third of the people out of hospital. You can get a certain blood test because your blood gets a little bit thicker and your, your cells uh, react. Uh, to this as well. So I'm going to be showing people how to live in harmony with Gaia, how to find groundwater, how to find the crossing point of particular grid lines that are considered to admit geopathic stress, such as the Curry Net and the Hartman Grid and the Benker grid. These grids are deemed to have uh, places upon them where you shouldn't sleep. And I'm going to show people how you can detect the symptoms of geopathic stress so that you can keep your family and loved ones very safe within your own home. Even if a, a young mum is out there listening to this radio show and your baby is crying and crying in the room, move the cot by say two meters or so and I can guarantee your baby will stop crying because children especially are sensitive to geopathic stress zones. But more than that, I'm going to be showing uh, the people on the workshop at Contact in the Desert how you can find positive earth energies that prolong your life, that are offer healing. I'm going to show people how you can work with uh, these types of energies, but more importantly, how to find them in the landscape. How can I find uh, a kind of semi-spiral pattern? They're very, they're very common throughout the, the planet. And how can I interact with that? I'm also going to be speaking about the, the, the spirit of place because as a Druid, I think it's very important that when we go to an ancient site, we think of the spirit of place, the uh, ancestors, and what's called the guardian. So I'm going to give a spiritual interpretation of how to work with an ancient site, as well as the earth energies and the kind of practicalities of uh, an ancient site. So it's going to be very thorough, and it's going to be very exciting uh, as well, because I'm uh, known in the UK to be an expert in the geodetic system of earth energies, I have inherited lots of surveys done from the 1920s way up to the 1960s of geodetic energies that flow through ancient sites. They're earth energies, and some of these energies are associated with deep water. 
and I'm going to be showing people how to find these. And there's a very few American dowsers that are familiar with the geodetic system of Earth energy. So I really want to go to America and show that there's all of these different diverse types of energies and not just ley lines and that you can have lay systems. So, so I really hope that people come along to the workshop and realize there's far more to Gaia's energies than just laying grid lines. And that once we recognize different types of energy, we can really understand why some people become ill, how we can easily uh, counteract geopathic stress and understand the land upon which we live on a very, very deep level. Okay, and, and if uh, people want to see the schedule, get tickets, and go to contactinthedesert.com and see where it's uh, being held, the uh, you know, dates and times, and uh, all, all the relevant information. Yes, all the re relevant information is that on the website of Contact in the Desert. If anyone has, you know, a, a question to ask me about, you know, it, you can always email me at Maria Wheatley uh, at AOL.com and I can uh, help you and advise you on, on things. If anyone does come to Contact in the Desert and wants to attend the Dowson workshop, please bring a Dowson instrument such as a pendulum or ideally some L rods, which you can buy online because obviously I can't take a ton of metal on a plane uh, with me across, uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> I would far outweigh what I'm supposed to carry in weight. So, so yeah, bring, uh, bring along uh, some of your pendulums. I'm also going to be showing on the workshop the Egyptian pendulum devices that the French diviners explored. So we're really going to be looking at dousing with a difference, and it will be a fun workshop. You'll go away as well with a PDF uh, manual that I compile for all of my dousing workshops. So don't think you've got to uh, take notes and things. You're, you're going to go away with a really good uh, manual that will help you understand dousing. And... Well, you're going to be speaking with um, all kinds of big names. George Norrie's there, uh, one of um, you know Barbara's favorite uh, um, guest. Uh, Brad Olson's going to be there. He's a <laughs> um, let's see who was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's go. like running up against royalty, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. You have all, all kinds of uh, huge names. Uh, it, it, it's um, Giorgio Sukulis is going to be there. Graham Hancock and his new uh, Graham's new book. Uh, seems to be getting a lot of um, uh, you know high praise. I think uh, our buddy Hugh Newman's going to be there. David Childress, and you get a lot of the ancient aliens people. Uh, you know Brian Forrester. Yes, I know Brian. I know it's going to be absolutely exciting. It's mm -hmm. got such an incredible lineup. Uh, of you know new faces and old faces that are widely uh, respected, so I, I think it's uh, it's going to be great. Yeah, do, uh, Dr. Lynn Katai is one of the speakers. I mean, she, she she's uh, j just very very interesting uh, lady. Uh, oh, yeah, like I said, said Brad Olson's going to be there. Uh, Travis Walton and. He's going to be talking about his, uh, you know, unique experience. Uh, he, he's, uh, you know, really a, a very nice guy. Spent uh, you know, some time with him a few years ago at the ARE, Kathleen Martin. I, I mean, you, know, you get some of the uh, biggest names in ufology and 
uh, you know, paranormal investigations are going to be there. I, I'm glad that you were finally contacted to be there. You, you, you deserve it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. It's uh, it's going to be, you know, uh, a sheer delight uh, to be there. And what I hope to do afterwards is to do the Anazazi Trail of some of the Kivas and some of uh, mm-hmm. America's ancient sites for future tours and in workshops uh, in other parts of America as well. So I'm going to really kind of utilize uh, my time there. So that's going to be exciting as well because... Apart from ley lines, uh, the sites haven't really been decoded as to what's there. And uh, I've, Dennis Stone actually sent me one old Dowson map, and that kind of just touches the side of America's Stonehenge, where it did show some lays and just some water lines. Well, I can really add to that, you know, um, in... In, in great detail so it's going to be so exciting for, for me to look at the ancient sites of america and start to decode them in terms of the earth energy and frequencies that prevail there so it, it's going to be a, a learning curve for, for me ancient america so i'm really looking forward to that as much as contact in the desert okay and what so a, a, after the conference you're going to uh be spending some time in what like uh the A- arizona area the yes desert. okay I've, I've worked out a route that uh i will be going with one of my uh students and two of my students of uh, dowson students actually and a lady that i met uh, in egypt that knows arizona quite well and we're going to look at the design canons of the ancient sites and what is their connecting principles and do they have earth currents there? If so, where are they? Yeah, do do they have, you know, particular types of lays? Do do they have an area where you get this like neutral zone? So I'm I'm gonna kind of be exploring all of that and and it will be quite quite exciting because it hasn't been done. It's going to be a new ground. I'm also going to be looking at some of the artifacts. I've got one of my students looking into uh, the artistic artifact sites. Uh, I'd like one day to do Ohio with you, Mark, because I know that you're a very thorough investigator yourself of ancient sites in your homeland area. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so it's going to be a case of um, looking at America from a very sacred point of view. And that's what I hope to add to the already good knowledge of lays that have been discovered in America. And I'm going to add on a few new layers to that to extend the work that's already been done. And the great knowledge uh, out there about the sites, too. So, yes, it's exciting. Yeah, it, and... It, um... Yeah, what, what, uh, Alfred Watkins did a, a lot of the uh, lay. Is that right? The, the the lay lines in like the 1920s, and there's like that shad. Uh, he, yeah, he has a lot of photos of like the, the long distance shadows uh, across the English countryside, and it, that that seems to have been uh, – that phenomenon has, seems to have been uh, very well documented for almost a uh, hundred years. But it, it is uh, – uh, has America been documented uh, – ha, has America had uh, its uh, like ley lines and all these earth energy uh, sites – uh, a- a- as thoroughly documented as uh, uh, it, like as southern England has, or is this like a pretty new field for America? Well, you're right. It was back in the 1920s that Alfred Watkins coined the term lay, and lay means line. 
So, you know, to the lay hunters moot of uh, Great Britain, if you say lay line, you're going to get a slap wrist because you're saying line line. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's an American thing, ley line. It's like lays uh, over here, actually. Okay. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, at the same time, intriguingly uh, so, in France, you had a researcher called Xavier Gouchard, and he was looking into lines in his native homeland of France. And what he discovered was that place names like Alusia, Alaise, they meant a place where people meet. And he found over 400 place names identical or phonetically very similar on these massive uh, lay, uh, lay system. Uh, America has qu quite well done, actually, uh, documented lays in Washington, Seattle, and places like that where they focused on the lay line. What I'm going to be focusing on is the 30 to 40 years um, understanding and knowledge of lay systems that have the earth currents entwining them. I mean, it was Hamish and Paul Broadhurst that first discovered that here in the UK. The ancient Chinese knew it, you know, like I said earlier, 2000 BC. And uh, Hamish uh, forwarded one of my books on Avebury, and he considered me to be, you know, a very uh, adept dowser. And I'm very familiar with the other authors that have uh, written about uh, Earth currents. I myself have found uh, back about 10, 15 years ago a lay system that has entwining, entwining Earth currents. I'm going to be looking for these type of things in ancient America because the lays have been well documented already by, you know, other American researchers. So, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be looking at it from a different perspective to really understand the art of placement. Because when you look at the art of placement, you will find that a particular entrance is what makes its size? Why do you have really large entrances at some henges or temples? And sometimes they're narrow and low to the ground. This is often because it's set by an earth current, for example. Or it could be that it's uh, the kind of tail end of what's called a geospiral. So it'd be really exciting to see the art of placement through the eyes of earth energy there. And, and other types of uh, lines and currents as well. So it's going to be a new venture, understanding ancient America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, d does sound like a fascinating study, and you have to come back and give us your conclusion. It, 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 I, I'd like to hear your you know, results you know, with you know what what the Native American people were doing, uh, th they seem to be very in, in tune with the uh, lays and you know the birth energy. Uh, uh, you know, you already documented the, the megalithic people, uh, and the Egyptians were uh, very much aware of it as well. It, it, it just and it's just interesting to see how pe uh, people on two sides of a huge ocean may have come up with the same conclusions. Uh, you know, talking about the uh, uh, the, uh, the measurements uh, of the entranceways. You know, I just want you know, wondering if that that was all this. Uh, you get the same units of measurement. I, 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 I'm, it's really a fascinating subject. I'm just uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about that, and you know, ho hopefully we can work together and uh, maybe try to get more answers from the Ohio Valley and what the uh, Adina and Hopewell people were also. Um, how they were engineering you know, their sacred circles as well. Yes, I mean, right. uh, it is. I mean, it, it's going to be, you know, a, a really good journey having a look at what the Ohio people were doing. And I know that's mm -hmm. where you have your expertise in, Mark. So it's, you know, it's fresh ground. 
it's, it mm-hmm. really is uh, fresh ground. And I, I feel as well that once we reconnect to a power place, once you enter an ancient site, uh, you are in an altered state of consciousness. You, you might feel it's, it's exactly the same as I felt, you know, like uh, earlier on in the day. But it isn't. People feel that kind of spirit of place, that kind of something's changed within them. And that's, that's not just the earth energy. That's the, the design of the building. It's the, the design of, you know, the monuments with, within a, a henge, for example. The alignment to the moon cycle, whether it's the moon's metonic cycle of 18.61 years, which Gerald Hawkins often called he was uh, an investigator of Stonehenge back in the 60s where you have the night of the high moon. And that's when you get the longest uh, night of moonlight. It's a bit like the opposite of the summer solstice, which is the longest day of like sunlight, Mm -hmm. uh, as it were. So all of these kind of different layers uh, that we have really do add to the uh, power of place. And and just looking briefly at America's Stonehenge, uh, it incorporates the eightfold dru- druid Celtic year. And that's what we call the kind of wheel of the year, which begins at Samhain, Halloween. Uh, October the 31st is New Year's Eve to the ancient Celts. And New Year's Day was uh, November 1, which we called Samhain. So the sun aligns, you know, all throughout the America Stonehenge at these eightfold placements, you know, the solstices, the equinoxes, and what we call the cross-quarter fire festivals of Samhain, as I said, uh, November the 1st, in bulk February the 1st, Beltane, well, Beltane's today, it's May Day, it's the the first day of summer to the uh, ancient uh, Druids, and Lammas, August the 1st. So there's some similarities between the ancient Celtic peoples of Europe and the, some of the uh, integration of the solar energies and alignments in American sites. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, I think you're really on to something that's going to be fascinating to see uh, you know, your research – develop uh, just uh, you know pe- people realizing uh, unrelated people realizing the same thing you know thousands of miles apart and you know just how observant uh in tune that these ancient peoples were to get uh you know, to pick up on this, and the concept is still relevant today. Even though, you know, it, 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 most of us you know, may not be aware of it, but you know, they've kept it alive for thousands of years. Uh, it just says something about the, the the truth of their observations. Well, yes, I mean they were master astronomers and. Right. Ma- uh, geomancers and they mm-hmm. could you know plot the course of the moon and they could plot the course of the sun and, and the stars uh, of which right. uh, Ross Hamilton's pointed out in his fascinating book called Star Mounds. So I mean there, there, there's a lot going on at ancient sites. It isn't just the, the earth energy, it's the sky above. It's your role in that as well. You know, what was what, what the role of the person within these uh, ancient sites? And one thing I think, and it's, uh, it, it may be to some a bit controversial, it may make sense to others, but when we look at a site like Avery Henge, you can fit thousands of people in there as the archaeologist, which I know you've uh, read about, uh, Mark, called Aubrey Bull, point mm-hmm. out you can fit thousands of people into Avery it's uh, uh, 27 acres now when you look to some of your ancient sites in ancient America you have four ancient and they're, they're the same kind of sizes and some of them are much much bigger like Newark in Ohio so let's mm-hmm. imagine for one moment 
you've got thousands of people in an ancient site but they a bit like when you go into a church for example you kind of know what's going to happen you know uh you might have a hymn for, i don't go to church i'm a pagan but i'm pretending for one moment i do know what goes on inside of a church <laughs> okay and uh, you have a hymn read and some prayers read, uh, etc. But could you imagine if the people were all switched on and it was about raising their consciousness, not the I, when I go to a site and what I experience, but the we, the us, and you experience something collectively together as a whole and maybe even raise your consciousness up as a whole rather than a personal uh, uh, individual. So I think, you know, ancient sites could have been about raising consciousness. They could have been lots of different things, uh, not just one thing. I mean, for example, going back to uh, our analogy of a church, you can get married, you, you, you know, you get buried in a church, you have christenings in a church. They were even used with their bells to decree, you know, that uh, an enemy was coming at one time, and etc. So there's many different layers to uh, ancient sites that I think we're, we're about to explore and uncover and delve deeper into. Okay, and, and since, since you're talking about the, uh, you know, what people were doing, the, the multiple purposes of, you know, these ceremonial centers and, you know, uh, what people were doing once they got there. Uh, and you've recently made a, a dis, discovery at Avebury where there's a new yeah you know, you're, you're you're claiming that there is an alignment that was previously uh not understood and what have you observed about this alignment? Is it like a, a you know, related to the moon? Uh, where you know where is it located uh, within the Avebury complex? And can, can you describe? Yeah, well, what? I I did a, a few uh, observations uh, at at Avebury. One of which was to do with a very unusual <clears throat> megalith which has uh, a seat. You can literally sit down on it. It's like being on a megalithic throne. Uh, it, it's quite spectacular. And the, the standing stone is offset. It's not face on like the other stones. It's a slight angle. Our ancient ancestors did everything for a reason. So I was thinking, well, what's going on here? And the Henge Bank, uh, seems to block the horizon view <clears throat> but that's because the Henge Bank was extended in the 17th century so that there was a little toll road and that's where you have to pay your dues to pass it in a horse and carriage so they extended the Henge Bank so you couldn't kind of gallop round the side you'd, you'd have to pay uh, the money so if you take it uh, Avery Henge back to the original design canon which the excavators in the 1930s found, one of which was called Alexander Keeler. And you take it back to the original uh, uh, length back, then you, if you were sat in that megalithic throne, you'd have seen the midwinter sunrise and the midwinter sunset. Intriguingly, though, there's a point if you're sat in that megalithic throne where your head will touch the stone quite naturally. You don't have to lean way back or anything. It's a natural happening. Uh, I've noticed that it will cause uh, a compass to really fluctuate. It's got like a bit of a magnetic anomaly there as well. So I think the ancients chose that stone for that as well. But more than that, it was also noticed that what what I noticed was that at Samhain, that's Halloween to, to Christians, that's a time when our ancestors 
uh, come out uh, with kind of in a spirit realm. And that's why people dress up as skeletons. It's when the veil between this world and the next grows thin. And it's a time to divine and communicate with your ancestors. What's the winter going to be like? Am I going to, you know, survive? But at that time of the year at Samhain, the shadows of that stone I've been describing called uh, the devil's chair should be called the druid's chair because <laughs> it's aligned to the sun uh, it joins a, a co-joins a shadow line with its partner which is the gateway to the southern inner circle and imagine standing just in front at, at Samhain and you see this gigantic black shadow line that would go for a long distance until it hit the chalk bank and kind of uh, uh, be a black line against the chalk. I really feel that our ancient ancestors stopped then and kind of crossed that dark line. And maybe they did some type of ceremony, like getting rid of the dross of the year, your mistakes or your woes, or uh, and thinking about your ambitions for the next and crossed through the dark shadow line. So it is quite wide and then back into the light again. So I don't think at an ancient site is just about the solar alignments or the lunar alignments. It's about the shadow lines as well. And in fact, it was a, a researcher called John Glover who went to a spectacular stone circle in the north of England. Oh, I love Castle Rig. It has a mountain range for a henge. It is, it is truly spectacular. And uh, John Glover noticed that the tallest megalith in that stone circle cast a shadow line at midsummer that was two miles long. Because you, you will notice that in English monuments that they tend to be on sloping ground. And sloping ground accentuates rather shadow lines. Stonehenge is on sloping ground. Avebury is on sloping ground. Castle Rig is on sloping ground. And it makes the shadow line extend. And, and Glover went on to discover that there were ancient sites aligned on the shadow line, as if it was like some kind of, like Watkins Lay, but it's, but it's a shadow line. So I think to understand ancient sites, you need to go there for the solar year, that eightfold year, and have a look at what's going on. Are there shadow lines? So then you can calculate using, you know, computer software, the sun's position as it was then compared to what it is now. And uh, I think there's going to be, you know, quite a few uh, alignments. And even if we go to Ireland on the Hill of Tara, it's a very famous place uh, in Ireland. And you have a mound called the Mound of Hostages, which is a Neolithic Khan, like a, a tomb shrine. It was a shrine before it was a tomb, which now archaeologists are actually calling them tomb shrines. It should be shrine tomb. <laughs> but anyway, at, uh, at uh, Samhain and in bulk sunrise, then the sun would illuminate the uh, inside of that Khan on those particular dates and it too would have generated a bit of a shadow line through uh, its shape so uh, I think it's you know looking with an eye for detail at ancient sites because our ancestors liked that sense of drama you know here you have all of these shadow lines these lays this uh, engineering of where to put stones to see to see the sunrise, having magnetic anomalies there as well. Like I say, it's never just one thing. It's it's like a bit of a a layer of different things, which like Barbara described earlier, within a consciousness experience, it's uh, it's uh, different layers. So yes, uh, I still think there's a lot to be discovered. Yeah, and, and, so so you're talking about this shadow line that. Yeah, it is what a uh, you know recent discovery uh, that that was uh, incorporated into the design of Avebury. Mm. Do yeah. do we have it, it, like the same uh, pattern? At 
the, the nearby Stonehenge, or is this uh, just pretty much exclusive to just Avebury? Well, no, because you have that at Castle Rig, and you have okay. that at uh, another Cumbrian stone circle called Long Meg and Her Daughters, where the outline stone will cast a uh, <coughs> shadow line. And it was uh, another author who noticed that the heel stone at uh, Stonehenge cast a kind of like phallic shadow that enters the kind of room-like circle of Stonehenge. That was noticed, and I expanded oh. upon his work because I noticed that some of uh, his theories were... Um, I extended them because I realized that shadows behave in a, a particular different ma manner. So it could be part of a fertility rite. It could have been part of a more, a more healing rite. But I think in ancient America, you may have had that as well. Because when I looked at one of your reconstructed timber monuments called Woodhenge in Illinois, mm -hmm then uh, I, I think that there would have been certain uh, timbers put in a particular area that would cast a shadow uh, or, or maybe sunlight in between them as well because that, that's, that kind of happens at some sites as well. So it's uh, understanding the sun's passage around something and how that interacts with shadow lines and with entrances that could be aligned to, to the sun uh, or to the moon. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I was just wondering uh, uh, about uh, just uh, uh, you know, a, a feature like the shadow feature at A because in um, Aubrey Burles, but I, I've always enjoyed you know, his uh, the Stone Circles of the British Isles. Uh, Book and he, you know, he he writes about uh, uh, you know Stonehenge was built to you know like out outdo Avebury and you know, it's just uh, it, it's uh, you know, just kind of interesting to see where it, it was basically it, it, like two churches you know trying to build a you know, Bigger steeple or higher uh, spire, you know, so, so, something like that. And, and it, it, it's kind of funny, but it's also interesting. And I, I was just wondering if, uh, you know, Stone, you know, Stonehenge opted to do, or the uh, builders of Stonehenge opted to do something uh, different. And you know, you know, we're just you know distancing or self from Avebury, and we're you know, going to focus on. Uh, the, yeah, it's some other kind of feature. It, it, it's it, it's just interesting to uh, con, you know, go, go back to, uh, to that time period and, and just kind of reconstruct the, the way the engineers were thinking. And just like you know, when we started the show with uh, all the. Architectural achievements of the Egypt, Egyptian people uh, uh, building over the water levels. So I was just, just 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 wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Aubrey Ball has said that. In fact, it was a 17th century antiquarian called John Aubrey who said that uh, Avery doth exceed Stonehenge as a cathedral doth a parish church meaning that, you know, Avebury was far, far bigger. You can fit lots of Stonehenges into, into Avebury Henge. It's yeah, massive. It has the largest stone circle in the world with over a diameter of over 1,000 feet. Over 1,000 feet. Stonehenge uh, is around about 98 feet in diameter, I, I give or take a few inches in imperial measurement. So, I mean, that's the, the size difference. It's 10 times bigger uh, in effect. But there was more monuments than just Avery and Stonehenge back in the Neolithic and Bronze Age day. Right in between, uh, at the centre of the axis line of Avery to Stonehenge, there was a site called Mardenhenge. And Marden was a gigantic henge monument that had sweat lodges, stone circles, a giant mound, uh, very similar to the American Ohio mounds that you study. Mm -hmm. 
So that was like a ceremonial centre right in the middle of Avebury and uh, Stonehenge. And then if you, and then we're going to draw a straight line now. We're going to call it a lay. And you've got a straight line. You've got Stonehenge at the south. Then you've got Mardenhenge. And uh, let's put Avebury on that. And now to the north, you have a spectacular, giant, concentric stone circle at Winterbourne Bassett with long avenues, long, long gone. It was broken up in 1746, and out of the estimated up to 80 stones of the stone circle, or even if you're conservative and say 60, they were all smashed up except for one. And one stone remains, and it's quite uh, colossal. And even if you go there today, something something stays there it's all of the stones have been raped and gone but there's something so spiritual about that place it was uh, dedicated according to the reverend edward duke who spoke of lays long long before alfred watkins and he drew a straight line and said that all of these ancient sites represented the planets the heavens above so winterbourne uh, Bassett Stone Circle, the concentric one, was dedicated to Venus. And when I was investigating this lay of uh, Edward Duke, I happened to be at the village and I was just sat by the stone. And uh, one of the old timers of the village who'd lived there all his life, God love him, uh, he came across me and said, you know, what are you doing? He saw me doing little diagrams and I showed him an old antiquarian drawing and how it related according to one idea to Venus. And he said, well, that's really strange. We have predominantly girls born here, which is quite a Venusian, uh, I thought. And then when we have a look at Marden Henge, for example, that site in between Avebury and Stonehenge, according to Edward Duke, that represented uh, the orbit of Mars. And den is an old English word for settlement and ma. So that means the settlement of Mars. And he said that Stonehenge was represented Saturn and Avery the sun and the moon. And other planets beside. Oh. I got an astronomer to uh, look at that and say, well, where's the outer planets of Uranus, Neptune and Pluto? And using the same method that the ancients did, which was quite as astounding they used silvery hill to represent earth and used the mean distance between uh silvery and let's say for example marden represented the mean distance in the heavens above between earth and mars and using that calculation we discovered the placement of the outer planets all of which represented ancient sites so for the Avebury Stonehenge environs uh, can represent a symbolic alignment to the planet. And I asked Rodney Hale. He often works with Andy Collins, who's written The Cygnus Mystery and many, many other books besides. A very learned uh, English author that I have a lot of respect for. Well, Rodney's worked with Andy and Rodney's worked with myself. And I asked Rodney to have a look at, you know, when did the planets align on a kind of similar, not identical, they wouldn't have been above Stonehenge, but they would have been alignment in the sky above. And it was at the exact date of uh, Stonehenge's and Avery's heyday of 2700, I think it was 40 BC, around about that time. So if you happened to be at Stonehenge then and looked above, you would have seen the planets in alignment. So, uh, again, you know, it's all of these different layers, the cosmology of, of the planets, of, of you in that space as well. It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Wow. Uh, uh, that, that is uh, some fascinating information. Uh, um, you know, you mentioned, like, the... Winterborne Bassett site is just it just has one uh remaining stone. Um you know, so, you know, we're we're down to like fourteen minutes or so. And you know, I also want to uh find out about like the what's going on with the possibility of like this road 
or mm-hmm. tunnel that's going supposedly going to be built by Stonehenge you know, is or are we looking at having uh a, another monument lost or uh, what's going on there we don't want to end up like uh, winterborn facet <laughs> no i mean you know the, the english heritage in their insanity have said that you know the the road is noisy roads are noisy admittedly and you right. know if you take the road out and make a tunnel you're not going to hear the noise of the traffic but you're in an artillery military area where you can hear gunfire bombs going off uh, and, and that, that type of thing as well. So it's not going to make the environment any quieter. Trust me on that. I live in uh, out on the outskirts of Marlborough, 17 miles away from Stonehenge, and I can hear them artillery firing on Salisbury Plain. I can hear the bombs going off. So imagine when you're there. In fact, when I take some clients there, I, uh, they say, what on earth is that noise? Is that thunder? No, that's a bomb going off on the Salisbury Plain. There, there's, so there's that to it. And also you have some wonderful archaeologists that have spent a long time working on a Mesolithic site going back 10,000 BC, quite close to Stonehenge. It's called Blick Mead. And they've been working on this site and found out that, you know, it's a Mesolithic settlement. This wasn't a hunter-gatherer place. People stayed there generation after generation, and it had a sacred spring there. Uh, well, you know, that's, that's going to go very, very close to that archaeological sensitive site. So the archaeologists are in uproar and say, you know, gosh, that, that shouldn't happen. And then in the insanity, again, of English heritage, they were going to put the start of the tunnel, which is going to have lights, it because obviously you've got cars going in a tunnel it needs a lighting system to it on the access line of where the midwinter sun sets and the archaeologists had to explain that to the engineers you you can't have it there it's going to obscure a very sacred point in the the solar year where people go to stonehenge to look at the the site so, you know, the, the A303, that's the name of the road that runs past uh, Stonehenge isn't the best road in the world it does get uh congested in in the summer but to to make a tunnel there going through archaeological sensitive areas i don't think is is the answer if they simply sunk the road the existing road you'd get away from the noise of the traffic and it would be in effect uh, a tunnel, but without the additional costs of going over the top. I don't know any one person that is into megalithic site that puts their hand in the air and says, I think this is a good idea. So um, is th- this project just in limbo at the moment? I think it will get, I think sadly it will get the go-ahead, but I think if it gets the the go-ahead, you have some very charismatic um, personalities that are associated with Stonehenge, one of whom is called King Arthur, and he has the Raven Warband behind him, which is a bunch of kind of biker druids, uh, uh, in a way that I think they would do something radical I, I don't think they they will take that. They they don't want this site to be violated anymore. You know, I mean, it's gone from being an open site given to the British people many years ago to a place where you've got to pay a lot of money to go in now, and you don't have access to the inner stone circle, and uh, you get personalities that dislike that. They call it pay to pray. Uh, if you're if you're a druid, you know why do you have to pay? But it could be argued that you know it's the upkeep, etc. But I think uh, we need to say no. We need to claim back the sacredness of our ancient sites because more and more they're being cordoned off. Whether it's Malta and other places, wherever you get a, a power place, you tend to get uh, people not wanting you to be there. And I find that quite strange in itself. And, you know, we're uh, down to like eight, eight minutes or so, you know, we'll uh, 
going to get into a maybe an easy question and give you uh, more time to plug every you know, your website and everything. But um, you know what? You know what have you learned from doing some some of your aerial photography? As you've gone, uh, flown over some of the sites, what what have you learned about the engineering? And just seeing it from a different perspective of you know, when I was there, and just you know, uh, seeing you know, a place like Maiden Castle from just ground level. I know. I mean, seeing the uh, ancient sites from the air is absolutely spectacular because you can fly from Stonehenge, for example, and then go on to Avery and other sites beside, like Maiden Castle in Dorset coastline. You can uh, also see. It gives you a kind of amazing understanding of the beauty of the sites from the air because because when you're on the ground, you're looking around and you're seeing large stones and, and giant stones. But from the air, you see all of the earthworks, the remnants. If it's a hot summer, like in England, we had a, an unusual summer last year. It was actually warm and hot, That's and it wasn't raining. So, I mean, it, it was an absolute delight, actually. But uh, when, when you have a hot summer, it kind of gives, leaves uh, in the ground parch marks where a former... Henge may have been, and it, it kind of alters the 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 soil content when a ditch has been infilled. So when you fly over in a hot summer, you can actually find lots of long lost monuments, which indeed people were doing with drones. For me, I learned a lot flying above the ancient uh, landscape, the scale of what our ancient ancestors were doing all across southern Britain and uh, to the north I've been uh, as well. It was the sheer scale. It was monument after monument after monument. And we must realize that in the British Isles alone, there was up to 900 stone circles that have survived and half of which are believed to have gone. So I mean, we're talking about thousands of monuments uh, across the ancient landscape. And that's what aerial photography did for me. It was the sheer scale. Okay, cool. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, uh, next time. Uh, yeah, and, just, and you know, the LIDAR and ground penetrating radar picking up more the of just how extensive these ancient sites were in such a concentrated area. It's just, just really fascinating. But, uh, you know, we have you know, about five minutes, four or five minutes left. And if, uh, you know, the listeners have enjoyed your thorough recreations of um, ancient Egypt and southern England, uh, you, you will be at Contact in the Desert at the uh, May 31st through June 3rd. They can get more information by going to contactinthedesert.com. Uh, you, you, uh, Maria, do you want to just you know, tell the listeners about your, your, your website, any other trips you have uh, coming up? Your uh, your book title, uh, the, the Elongated Skulls of Stonehenge, is a fascinating book that yeah. you authored. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, I, and I'm writing a, a much bigger book uh, at the moment about Stonehenge, the secret history of Stonehenge. I hope to have out next year. But yeah, listeners, if uh, you want to go to my website, I have the Avebury Experience dot co dot uk but i love the way americans say avbury so i'm going to say the avbury experience dot co dot uk that's a v e b u r y the avbury experience dot co dot uk and also i've got a teaching platform where i teach uh courses in dowsing and other esoteric subjects at esoteric college dot com Okay, and when, 
when you're at contact in the desert, uh, will you uh, be discussing anything about uh, black goo? No mention of black goo will be said at contact in the desert. <laughs> okay. All right. That, uh, facial. <laughs> Okay, and uh, you know we don't want to forget that um, you know you know if um, you know, anyone acts up at uh, contact in the desert, you might have one of your uh, Viking swords there. <laughs> so so uh, be, behave yourselves. Yes, I have a, a sword collection, and uh, but I don't think I can sneak that through customs, Mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, if, I'll call the queen and t- you know, just w- w- let her know and you know, get, get give you a pass on <laughs> s- sneaking that through. Um, so, you know, it sounds like you have you know, a, a, an exciting month ahead of you and you know your trip to Arizona and you know, I I think we had you, you scheduled to come back in a couple of weeks to uh, give us a little bit more information and you know we have uh, you know more great shows lined up you know, Bar- you know Barbara and I have uh, some really good stuff lined up uh, throughout May and June September's filling up with some great conferences. So, um, yeah, we yeah, just just uh, keep checking uh, Barbara's website, barbaradelong.com, for uh, our, our get you know, the roster. And you know, Maria, we want to thank you for uh, being with us today. Uh, we're just about out of time. Is you have like thirty seconds to wrap up anything. Well, it's been such a pleasure, as always, to talk someone to someone that's uh, knowledgeable about ancient sites in Ohio. So, from a like-minded perspective, I respect uh, your work, and thank you to Barbara and thank you, Mark, for having me on. It's-